Our message for today is entitled, Was Dead and Is Alive. We read it just a moment ago in that marvelous passage in the book of Revelation. In fact, twice we read it. And in that passage, Jesus presents himself as the Alpha and the Omega. Not merely as the Alpha, but as the Omega. The Alpha coming into the world, the one who will end and finish the world as we now know it, the one who is the summation and completion of all things. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we look at your word today, we pray that your word will examine us, that it will pierce the darkness of our hearts. That the gospel light of Christ, the risen Savior, might penetrate in areas where there needs to be some cleansing. That you will cause us to understand that this life is not all that there is, but this life is important because we must give an account for this life before the one who was dead and is alive forevermore. Father, we pray for the blessing of your word as it goes forth this day, that it would not return unto you void, but that it would accomplish that which you please, that it would be that which is not just pleasing to you, but that, Father, which glorifies Christ. It will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. We commit these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Revelation begins, as we've just seen here in both chapter 1 and chapter 2, with the resurrected Christ. And you know, as we get to the end of the book of Revelation, we discover that the book of Revelation ends with the resurrected Christ. We start with the resurrected Christ, we end with the resurrected Christ, the book that tells us the future of the world and of all of eternity to come. The entire prophetic future of the world is that recorded between the first and the last chapters of Revelation, and all of that hangs in the balance. If there is no resurrected Christ, there is no meaning. There is no reality. There is no purpose. There is no authenticity. There is no hope. If there is no resurrected Christ, there is no meaning to anything that you think or say or do. Without the resurrected Christ, there will be no end of death. Think about that. Without the resurrected Christ, there will be no judgment of the wicked. Without the resurrected Christ, there will be no heaven. Without the resurrected Christ, there will be no rewards. Without the resurrected Christ, there is no reason to love or to be loved. Without the resurrected Christ, there is no right or wrong. There are no morals, there are no ethics, there are no reasons for kindness to other people, but only hopeless, black despair, only selfishness, self-indulgence, brutality to others who have what we want. There's only a life filled with meaninglessness and anger and cursing the darkness. But we have the resurrected Christ. Revelation begins with that resurrected Christ in chapter 1. He is not only risen, but he gives a tree of life and a crown of life to those who follow him. He guarantees that those who are his will not be hurt with the second death. We just read it. He is the first begotten from the dead in chapter 1, and he raises and gives life from the dead to those who believe on him. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And so Jesus continues as we move through the book of Revelation, continues as the lamb who had been slain, who is standing, he is alive, he is risen, after he has been slain, and after the marvels and judgments of the world, the book of Revelation ends with the re resurrected Christ the sacrificial lamb, no longer dead but standing and risen from the grave. 
And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, but it's standing, having seven head, horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death. Neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega. The same thing that he said back in chapter 1. We're in 21 right now. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. If Christ is not risen, this will not happen. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega. That's how he introduced himself in chapter 1. The beginning and the end, the first and the last. We're in chapter 22 now. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. There are seven churches listed there in the opening three chapters of the book of Revelation. But Jesus didn't just send it to that individual church. Each of those epistles written through his amanuensis, John. You remember I read twice. Hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That was written for us. And he emphasizes it again here as we come to the end of the book of Revelation. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star, and the spirit and the bride. That's us. Say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is the first, come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. We begin with the resurrected Christ. We end the book of Revelation and move into eternity future with the resurrected Christ. Consider the implications well. If Jesus is not risen from the dead, Without the resurrected Christ, there is no future, but only the eventual, inevitable, slowly grinding victory of the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy. The first two laws of thermodynamics are the best proved laws in the physical universe. No scientist in the world questions these laws as they're seen in action today. You say, what does that mean? Entropy. That means that everything will ultimately wear out. That means that everything that is wound up will unwind. That means that everything will run down and run out. That means that all stored energy will dissipate. That means that everything will reach a state of equilibrium just like water when it runs downhill it finds its lowest place and then eventually becomes totally calm no movement no life everything that's producing energy will grow cold everything that lives will die and the universe will become cold and dark and still and lifeless and empty and void as the empty dead chunks of matter wander aimlessly through a starless nothingness without the resurrected Christ in the end we are all dead in the end there is no reason to live Paul addresses that in 1 Corinthians 15 
For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Do you understand why the resurrection of Christ is important? The resurrection of Christ has implications for us as to how we live, what we believe, whether we will make a difference in the world that surrounds us. This morning at the sunrise service, we read all four passages out of the Gospels that deal with the resurrection of Christ. After the women had come to the tomb, after Peter and John had run to the tomb and found it empty, after they had heard the various reports, they were still hiding out. They had not yet been energized, mobilized, exercised, or blasted off dead center to terrified motionlessness. Blasted out of their heart-gripping, paralyzing fear. On the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews. They've already heard that Christ is risen. They've had witnesses. Two of them at least have gone to the tomb and seen it empty and come back. But they're not yet empowered. They're not yet energized. They're not yet convinced. They're still hiding out for fear of the Jews. Then came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. <clears throat> and when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. But you know, they still did not move. They remained incognito. They still groveled in hiding, hoping that nobody would see them. For 50 days they were paralyzed. You see, Pentecost had not yet arrived. The permanently indwelling, awesome, empowering, articulately testifying Spirit of God had not yet entered into his new temples. The text goes on in verse 24, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, which was not with them when Jesus came, the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord! But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side. I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God, Would you want Jesus to take your finger and stick it into the hole in his hand? Because you will not believe. Would you want Jesus to reach out and grab your hand and pull it and you cannot resist and stick it into his side? Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, 
thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Dear friends, that's where we are. We have not seen, but we have the eyewitness testimony of those who have seen, those who were willing to give their lives for what they had seen, those who were witnesses unto the death for what they had seen. Seeing, experiencing, but they had both those things. There was one thing that Thomas was missing, and faith. Without faith in the risen Christ, there is no salvation. Without faith in the resurrected Christ, there is no power. Without faith in the resurrected Christ, there is no ability to overcome fear. Without faith in the resurrected Christ, there is no movement. Without faith in the resurrected Christ, there is only the inevitable anticipation of cold, dark, meaningless death. It is through believing, through faith, that there is life. That's how John closes his epistle. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And then that beautiful last phrase, and that believing ye might have life through his name. You see, that's what the resurrection is all about. Life. Not only the life of the resurrected Christ, but the eternal life that he gives to those who believe. The life that goes on after physical death. The life that continues into the future. The life that moves with triumph through the book of Revelation. The life that moves with power through the destruction of this world and into eternity. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells us that. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection from the dead. For, as in Adam, all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, that's the resurrection. Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have put delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority under his power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. The end of things as we know it is coming. Entropy itself will be destroyed with that last enemy, death, when death is destroyed. The old things will be burned up and the sin that tainted this world and brought it to vanity and decay will be vaporized. 2 Peter 3, But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire and against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth and all the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What does that mean? seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. Because Christ is risen. He is the judge. Judgment is coming. He's not slack concerning his promises. Do you follow Peter's reasoning here? What difference does it make for us? He tells you in the next phrase. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. As Peter tells us, 
It's the great truth of the resurrection that guarantees the future. It is the great truth of the resurrection that guarantees the prophecies. It is the great truth of the resurrection that guarantees the end of this sin-cursed world. It is the resurrection that provides the only motivation and the only power that is strong enough to overcome the drag of sin that constantly pulls us down into the muck drowning pit of filthy unholiness. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. The resurrection of Christ guarantees the imminent return of Christ. The resurrection of Christ and the return of Christ is what provides the most powerful motivation for holy living. Oh, dear friends, if Christ is not risen, Christ is not returning. If Christ is not returning, you have no reason to live a holy life. But because he's risen, listen to what John tells us. In 1 John chapter 3, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God? And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now listen to verse 3. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. The resurrection is the guarantee that the future is coming. The resurrection is the motivation to live a holy life for Jesus Christ. The power of that future day of judgment and terror of the unbelieving world is seen in microcosm at the resurrection of Christ. Did you know that? Matthew chapter 28, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, now here we have the little microcosm of what is coming. There was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Friends, the, the resurrection was an event that literally shook the physical earth. It was an event that shook the soldiers. It was an event that shook the Sanhedrin. It was an event that shook the proconsulate of Judea. It was an event that literally shook the Roman Empire, and ultimately it shook the world. You see, the grave had not only been guarded, it had been sealed with the seal of the emperor. No living man would dare violate the seal of Caesar. It was officially off limits and guarded by soldiers who would die if the seal was broken. Now think about this for a moment and then multiply it by what you see in the book of Revelation. We know exactly how the stone was moved. All it took was one mighty angel. He was indeed a mighty angel. When he descended from heaven and landed on earth, it caused an earthquake of intense magnitude. But it was not the earthquake that moved the stone. The angel himself moved the stone. Verse 2, Behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the uh, stone from the door and sat upon it the angel that did it. Now remember the earthquakes of the book of Revelation. Where the risen Christ is sending his judgments on the earth. Remember the mighty earthquake that breaks open the city of Jerusalem and splits the Mount of Olives in half. Remember the hail and fire and lightning and the horrifying fear of men on the earth as they scream in abject terror for the mountains to fall on them and cover them. We see just a touch of that power at the resurrection. But someday the resurrected lamb will slaughter. book of Revelation makes it clear. More than 50% of the world's population as he judges the earth in power and glory. Men were terrified there by a single angel. Imagine the terror when they see the resurrected Christ whom they have rejected. 
His countenance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow, and for fear of him the keepers did shake and become as dead men. Compare the stone with the angel and moved with death. Jesus was dead. You know, folks, death is a bigger obstacle than a tiny little rock on a tiny little hill in a tiny little country on a tiny little planet in the middle of a tiny little solar system in a monstrously large universe that God had created by just speaking a word. Moving stones is no problem for the God of the universe. But now we have to face 2015. Sadly, each person who hears of the resurrection responds differently. Some believe and some reject. Some mock as they did when Paul preached on Mars Hill in Athens. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him and they said, What will this babbler say? Others, some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is whereof thou speakest, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. He preached Jesus in the resurrection, remember? That was the unknown God, whom they did not know because they would not know. The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commendeth all men everywhere to repent. All men everywhere. Does that include me? Yes. Does that include you? Yes. Is it a an option? No. Is it a suggestion? No. It is a command. Have you repented? Is there sin in your life? The resurrected Christ is the judge of all the earth. He was dead and is alive. God has commanded all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he hath ordained whereof he hath given us assurance unto all men in that, and here it is, he raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. The Creator God, the incarnate God, the crucified risen God is judge of the earth. The resurrection proves that he is both the power and the authority to judge all the earth. When you speak to people today about the resurrected Christ, they'll respond just like they did in Acts 17 on Mars Hill. Some will believe and some will mock. Some may decide to postpone it for a while. We will hear thee again on this matter some other time. So like Herod to Agrippa, you know, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. Uh, come again, said Felix, and I'll hear you at a more convenient time. Folks, you may be part of that group. The more convenient time may never come. This may be your last opportunity to hear and believe. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. You're a sinner. You're lost. You're headed for hell. Jesus took your place. He died for your sins. He was buried. And what we celebrate today is not just sort of a nice holiday that comes around once a year where we have a big fancy meal. We celebrate the resurrection from the dead because the, everything in the future hangs on the resurrection of Christ. Your life hangs on the resurrection of Christ. 
Your continuation into eternity hangs on the resurrection of Christ. Judgment upon the earth hangs on the resurrection of Christ. Eternal life hangs on the resurrection of Christ. And you are delaying? You are not yet trusting the Savior? You are hoping that maybe your, your Christian heritage will help you because you had saved parents and grandparents? You're thinking, well, you know, I don't want to do that yet because i got a lot of growing up to do and I want to have a lot of fun first. You may not live till tomorrow. Do you understand that? I've watched even little children die. I've been there as a teenager took his last breath and stepped into eternity. And they will have to stand before God in judgment. Do you know for sure that if you were to step out of this body right now into eternity, do you know for sure that for you to be absent from the body would be to be present with the Lord? If you don't, you'd better make today the day that you trust Christ. This is serious business. You know, in the Gospels, the soldiers saw the same supernatural manifestations that the women saw. They were there. They saw the angel. They saw him move the stone away. They saw the empty tomb. They heard the exact words that the angel said to the women. They had a head knowledge. In fact, they even had an experiential knowledge. They had felt the earthquake. They had visibly seen the angel. They had the same opportunity to repent and believe and come to salvation, just like the women. But we find them responding in a different manner. They rejected. Seeing and hearing the same thing only made them afraid instead of drawing them to Christ. The women ran joyfully to tell the news of the resurrection. But look at what the soldiers did. And when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Passover began at sundown this past Friday, actually on Good Friday. That doesn't happen very often where the two actually overlap on the same day. But Christ, our Passover lamb, has been slain for us to pay for our sins. And his resurrection from the dead is the proof that God the Father has accepted his sacrifice. And it should make a difference in how we live. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. The crucified and risen Christ is the reason that we have to purify the leaven of sin out of our lives. The crucified and risen Christ is the reason that we must not harden our hearts to the terrifying implications of a world without the resurrection, a world that ends in empty, sullen, black death. And we must not harden our hearts to the reality of what is coming if there is a resurrection. The judgments of the book of Revelation. Judgments by the one who was dead and now is alive forevermore. What are those things that harden our hearts to this truth? Well, there's experience. There's pragmatism. There's practicality. There's pleasure. There's procrastination. And there's fear. That's what we see in the hearts of the disciples. They knew that when you're dead, you're dead. They had experience with that. They had seen dead people. They had seen many crucifixions at the time of Christ. The Romans often lined the streets going to Jerusalem with people that they were killing on crosses as a warning to the Jews not to raise a rebellion. When you died on a cross, you were dead. They had experience. They were pragmatic. They were practical. Okay, it's over. Time to move on. How do we get out of this with our skin still intact? And they were afraid. But there's one more thing that hardens the heart more than anything else, and that one thing is unbelief. We read it in our text. 
It's not ignorant unbelief. It's willful, stubborn refusal to believe. Even when presented with the evidence, when a man chooses not to believe, his heart is harder than the hardest stone. I hope this is not true. But some of you here today may be stubbornly resisting the truth and hardening your hearts. Peter later in his life talks about this willful ignorance. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heaven and the earth which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The willingly ignorant man has only judgment and fire to look forward to. If not for the grace of God, that man is doomed. Ask yourself the question, are you willingly ignorant? You know that there are only two options. Knowing what you know if there is no resurrection and what you know if there is a resurrection. Only two options. Either yes or no, there's a resurrection or there is not a resurrection. If you've never trusted Christ, you have no hope either way. But in placing your complete faith in him, you have nothing to lose. Only the unbeliever loses both ways. Does it not seem utterly foolish to you to reject him and face the future with absolutely no hope? That's the point Paul makes in 1 Corinthians 15. If the resurrection is not true, not only is your faith empty and, and deluded, but that means that you are still shackled by your sins and you are on your way to hell. That makes the resurrection a critically important issue because the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Did you get it? If the resurrection is not true, then the only thing that is eternal is death. Let me say it again. If the resurrection is not true, then the only thing that is eternal is death. Death is the last enemy to be destroyed. The first fruits resurrection of Christ is necessary for the rapture and his second coming. His return for his bride, the church, is necessary for our resurrection. Our resurrection must precede the end and the rule of Christ over all of his enemies. Then and only then will death be destroyed. If the resurrection is not true, then the only thing that lasts forever is death. That's the ultimate conclusion that the unbelieving pagan must arrive at if he or she is a thinking man or woman. Yes, Christ is risen indeed. And the risen Christ transforms lives. Just like he changed that band of cowards in the upper room as they hid behind locked doors, he can change you. The one who was dead and is alive not only changed them, but he set the world on fire with a glory that can never be suppressed. Do you know for sure that he's transformed you? Do you know for sure that he has put his spirit within you? Do you know for sure that you are saved? Do you tremble with fear that perhaps you're not saved? If you're not saved, you should tremble. The risen Christ is the judge of all the earth. If you know the truth and do not respond, you fall under his judgment. And if you know for sure, ah, the question I always ask, how has it changed your life? Do you really know him as your risen Savior and Lord? If not, today is the day of salvation. Today he can transform your life. Today he will give you the heart of flesh and remove the hard heart of unbelief if only you will trust him. Call on him to save you from your sins. Do it now, in the quietness of this moment. He can hear you as you lift your heart to him in faith. 
believe that he died for your sins and that he was buried and that he rose again from the dead trust him to save you don't wait another day let your new eternity begin today as you take the hand of Jesus the risen Christ now and forever and when I saw him I fell at his feet as dead and he laid his right hand upon me saying unto me fear not I am the first and the last I am he that liveth and was dead and behold I am alive forevermore amen and have the keys of hell and of death amen our gracious Heavenly Father how we thank you once again for your word and for its power the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even through the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Father, today we've read your Word. Today we've read many passages dealing with the resurrected Christ. We've seen the consequences of that. Consequences for those who are saved, consequences for those who are lost. We've seen with joy and thanksgiving how the resurrected Christ also transforms our lives that we might lead lives that are pleasing to you lives committed to your service lives that are obedient lives that are filled with holiness and purity and with joy father I pray that if there's someone here today young or old male or female that he or she might trust in Christ if they have never done so before that today they might say Yes, Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I'm lost. I know that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. <clears throat> Your word promises that if I will trust him, that he died for me, that he was buried, that he rose again, that if I trust him alone and only him, he'll give to me eternal life. And today, Father, I believe. I'm not going to be like Thomas, who said, I will not believe. I have not seen him, but I believe that I believe your word is true. Save me, I pray, in Jesus' name. Dear one, if you've prayed that prayer, then Jesus has given you eternal life. It doesn't have to be some kind of earth-shattering experience. It doesn't have to be some kind of outward manifestation, but it will eventually show up in your life. Father, thank you again that today is the day of resurrection. The reminder that Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. How we thank you that indeed Christ is risen. And Father, we thank you for his eternal life, which he has freely given to us through faith. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>